My name is Robert Jacob. I'm a PhD student of the Interdisciplinary Center of Fluid Dynamics, which is incorporated in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And today I'm going to impart the third seminar of the Fluid Dynamics Circulus. And I'm taking part of the Primate project, which I'm going to talk later about. And I think the first step. Um, or starting this is I have to explain some keywords of this title. So first, I'm going to talk about coherent structures, a very brief uh, description. If we see this recording from Kuhn et al, we can see that despite that turbulence is quite chaotic, there are some structures that can be seen here. So basically the research of the last century was based in stochastic analysis. But recently we got techniques, computational techniques, but also experimental techniques that make it actually possible to better observe and predict and describe those structures that are found in this pipe flow. Also, I want to talk about this um, definition of hidden skeleton, which doesn't come from me, it comes from a researcher called Peacock, who used it in his article. And so he's using it because it's still quite complicated to actually proper observe them. So this is actually going to be a one part of this um, seminar that I want to show some methods how we can visualize them. Why are coherent structures important? Well, they're everywhere. There's actually a research article. So um, the content of this, this work is basically divided in four parts. First, I'm going to make an attempt to describe, define coherent structures and try to obtain some formalization. Also, I want to present what has been observed so far. Then I am going to talk about the primate experiment that I'm taking part of and how is its relation to coherent structures. And eventually I'm going to talk about the methods, how we can visualize actually those coherent structures. Well, in first attempt of definition, one could be, I know them when I see them. As you can see, for example, in the first video, um, this is a fluidic oscillator, there are no moving parts inside, and still we obtain those patterns. Um, so in order to obtain a bit more formalization, take a look on the video down here. This is a closer look. Um, those are streamlines of the flow. Um, this videos are, were done with PIV analysis. And so, one way to define first, you can go to the Latin word. So coherence has some analogy to consistence. And so if we observe this lower video, so what is consistent here? And what we can observe is there's like some spatial, but also temporal coherence. For example, if you see those forming vortexes here, so there's uh, periodic oscillation between their formation, right? And, and also we have a kind of spatial periods. So this would be one way to get closer to the phenomenon. Also, what we want to do, what is our wish is that we can somehow decompose those complex turbulent structures into smaller ones. So forming some canonical building blocks to better describe the whole. As you can see here, I say that the whole flow is like a function of, well, smaller structures, right? Here, I want to give a very brief review on the research 
concrete structures. I think we all know this uh, experiment from Osborne Reynolds, where he used actually dye to observe what is happening inside the flow. And he observed that there's some point that we obtain those uh, fluctuations, right? And as well, he was able to observe those are actually original drawings, those structures forming inside the flow. So this was one of the very first attempts to, to actually visualize Korean structures. And as I said before, nowadays we have a bit more sophisticated methods to observe them. And so nowadays we have basically the two branches. We have the experimental branch where for example, important names are Adrian or David Dennis. And we also have those simulation focused research, which is basically was basically enabled due to better computers that allows to make DNS simulation to simulate all the total scales in a flow and thereby also visualize the structures. So why do they actually matter? Why are we interested in Korean structures? Well, from a bird perspective, we could say, we can see what is study here from Wood in 2004, 16% of the total energy consumed in the US is used to overcome aerodynamic drag and transportation systems. So this drag, of course, is directly related, right? You can see in this diagram from a different article, uh, which, is to, which describes how the energy of a car is being dissipated or consumed, and we have also this air drag part. But you can easily extrapolate this perspective to energy systems in general. Everything that is related to pipe flow, for example, the main way to transport flow fluid uh, will always be related to this dissipation of energy. Now, from a closer perspective, maybe our perspective as research, researchers, um, well, we have those Brands equations, the random average neighbor Stokes equations, um, where we obtain this additional part, which represents the Reynolds shear stress. And we know that this Reynolds shear stress takes a very important part in the, in the shear in general, right? So we can see here in this graph, how the Reynolds stress actually contributes in addition to the viscous drag to the whole drag of the flow. So, and we are interested in understanding how those components of the velocity in the Reynolds track are actually correlated. And one way to go for it is to understand the coherent structures. So the first attempt to categorize them and yeah, it's just to take a look on this DNS simulation, which is a huge work, a lot of uh, points, a lot of nodes to simulate this. Uh, it's only possible to do this on a supercomputer. And so here there was used the vortex identification criteria to actually visualize what is happening with the structures. And what we observe is that there are many different canonical flows involved. So therefore it makes sense to actually categorize by, by flow type. So here we can see that we have the wall flow, then uh, in some moment we have some separation. Then after the airfoil actually we have a mixing layer and way behind the, the, the airfoil, we actually also have uh, some kind of uh, vortex shedding, right? And all those total and economical flows, they can show different type of equivalent structures. Also, uh, an important way to categorize them is to take a look on their scale. For example, we have the large scale motion, the SL SLM, L LSM structures that if you talk about pipe flows, normally they're categorized to be two to three pipe radius, and also the, the bigger ones, 
the, the very large scaling motions. And of course, uh, a very intuitive way is to uh, categorize them by their, by their shape, by how they look like. So we, nowadays we have many different types of coolant structures that are often co-related. Uh, for example, streaks, bursts, hairpins, traveling waves, and much more. And yeah, I'm just talking about the first regarding to uh, some time issues here. So, <clears throat> so turbulent streaks and bursts, those were actually the early structures being uh, observed. You can see here in figure seven, um, some visualization of air bubbles at a risk length of five. And so what we actually observe are those, are those patterns that can extend quite far downstream, the flows going from top to bottom, and they go up to like some thousand risk of bank scales. And they're stream wisely oriented. And basically what they do is they diverge from our pool velocity. And the bursts, actually, those are called the structures that in addition to the streaks, they also include some lift or drop components, right? If we see, for example, this figure here, figure eight, we have a quadrant analysis of our velocity components. And we can see in this PDF that we have um, some states that have, uh, that are predominant, right? For example, those uh, Q2 and Q4, they are much more common than Q1 and Q3. So this means those bursts, they're actually subcategorized in the sweeps that are dropping motions with higher velocity and the ejection that go up from the, from the wall with a lower velocity. Another type of coolant motions are the quasi streamwise and spanwise vortices, and also the hairpins, which are also quite related. So you can see here on figure nine, just like a nice image from Adrian. Um, you can see those hairpin vortex, they are sitting actually on top of the, on the streaks, and they as well. They form in package, actually laying around those streaks. And what you can see here is that there are some characteristic angles. For example, observing the legs, they're normally observed in, at an angle of 45 degrees. And those are results of, of mental balances, which what articles have shown. And we also can see this angle here of, of the heads. And this angle is actually something that is quite characteristic. We have all seen them. I've seen, uh, I can show you later a photo of that. Um, and also what we can observe is that actually their size scales uh, with distance to the wall as well. Okay. Um, in this part, I want to talk a bit about our climate experiment. Um, here are the people that are involved in the project. It's Juliana Loredo and Luca Modicono, Modicone, who are my supervisors. Then the collaborators, David Dennis, who is actually Everpool, who is an expert on experimental visualization of Korean structures. And Dr. Mayoja Ovolabi, who is right now with us in the laboratory and also the student Carlos Oliveira was also helping on the technical part. And so this pipe break, this primate experiment, it's actually the full form is pipe break for the investigation of magnetically affected turbulence in electrolytes. So also as well, I have to explain some, some uh, features here. Uh, why magnetically? Well, we are interested 
to see how magnetic fields can actually uh, have an impact on those coherent structures. So it goes in the area of, of MHD turbulence. And well, why do we say electrolytes? There are some eight-dimensional numbers, especially the Hartmann number, that needs the fluid to be electrically conductive, very conductive, in order to see the effect of the magnetic fields on turbulence. So uh, in the past, most MHD experiments, they were done in opaque fluids, for example, mercury. But the bad thing on this is if you really want to see structures inside, uh, you need a transparent fluid. And one way to obtain those high Hartmann numbers is to use hydrochloric acid, which is going to be used in this experiment. Um, you can see um, a flow diagram and also the proposed design for the primate laboratory. So it's a confined experiment, remote controlled, and it's actually it's in a closed room because um, hydrochloric acid is not something that is easy to deal with. And for now, we are having a prototype here in the Nijif laboratory that works just with water. And here we can see some photos and also a render image of those um, magnet, mag magnetic rings that are uh, allocated around the pipe. So there are those six chambers that are full of magnets. And we have 15 of them. And this is how we actually have this magnetic field around the pipe. And yeah, so those small magnets, they are quite strong. You can see here we are uh, presenting them like in a meeting of the Vitam meeting. And so those are the small magnets. And as well, you can see my face, my old face about them. Um, they are quite strong, so 5,000 Gauss. Um, we had already some incidents that shows that, that we have to treat them with quite a careful manner, right? Um, yeah, a small excursion on, on PIV, or rather stereoscopic PIV, which is quite different from conventional PIV. Um, so SPIV is uh, a 2D three-component analysis. So it means um, we have a 2D image, which is normally a sheet. In our case, it's a flow orthogonal plane. So that means the pipe goes in this direction. And we are having two cameras that are angled in a way to observe what is actually happening in this plane. So in order to obtain this um, observation plane and focus, it's also important to have a special angle between the image or sensor plane and also the lens plane. So this is called a shine fluke configuration. It's important that all planes, so the object plane, the lens plane, and also the image plane meet in this point in order to get the right focus on the image. So that means we have two high-speed cameras and they're taking images of flow particles passing through this area. And well, if we know the, if we take um, time resolved images, we know the, the time step between the images. Um, then if we know where the particles in each time instant is, then we can create a vector. This is the basic concept, concept of, of uh, conventional PIV in the case of stereoscopic PIV, it's still a bit more complicated. So you can see here in this right image that the green and the red frame, they actually represent the, the two camera image planes. And we have to interpolate them on a common grid, which we can see here. And what we have them is that we have, for each point, we have two uh, two component vectors. And then from those two component vectors together, we can reconstruct actually the 3D vectors, three components. So this results in a 3D vector map. 
So here you can see uh, our calibration target, which is basically the grid we are using. So each camera has to be taught what it is seeing because one camera is not able to see three dimensions. So we have this calibration target, which is 3D. We explain to the SPIV program that those dimensions are being seen. And this is on a very uh, light level how, this, how those optical systems are being teached, right? So we have to bring this target with the red slide into the observation area, which is here, which is in the water box, water box to decrease the light diffraction between water and air. You can see here uh, that we're using a magnetic mechanism to bring this target slide actually into the observation area. Why do we use this target slide? Because uh, in some future we, we want to use acid, so that means there can, can't be any part in contact with any metallic part in contact with the fluid. Actually, this target slide, I forgot to, to mention, it's made by 3D printing. So, and then we have those external magnets and we have internal metallic parts inside the slide. And this helps us to, to move the target inside the calibration area. And after calibration, we get it back into its parking space, which is in here behind the outlet. Okay. <clears throat> here you can see some photos of the, of the observation area. You can see here our high-speed camera. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see the tilt shift between the lens and the, the sensor plane. Um, and of course, for the calibration procedure, we need a lot, lot of light to have a good contrast. And so we can see the two cameras at a 45 degree angle. Uh, Watching into the, the, the water box, and this is the flow pipe, right? And um, here you can see the laser. In this constellation, we had the laser here on the top, and it was pointing horizontally against the mirror, and from there it goes down the 90 degree angle. Um, well, now we changed the laser actually uh, on top of the observation area, which resulted a bit easier. Here you can see the calibration target that is seen from, from the cameras. And we have a quite good resolution because our pipe is a six inch pipe, which is quite big for SPV experiment. And you can see here this image model fit. This basically in a rough manner represents this uh, interpolation grid. So once we, we talk the camera, report the cameras, what they're actually seeing, this is a 3D grid. Then we can, for example, de-warp the images. So it means we are de-warping this 45 degree angle to uh, a direct angle. So this is as if the camera would be sitting inside the pipe. So now we're seeing it from a direct perspective, right? And here as well, we can see a PIV instantaneous PIV image. And after the de-warping procedure, we see exactly the same image, but now it's de-warped and the camera plane is orthogonal to our image plane. And here you can see a PIV recording. Um, it is actually treated to, to still enhance the contrast because the, the cross-correlation algorithm of the PIV needs, of course, uh, quite good signal noise detection, right? And well, you can, you can see some, some images. Those were taken at Reynolds numbers of roughly 24,000, which is also quite high because we have a big pipe. And we are using a trigger, trigger rate, which means we have uh, five hertz, uh, so five, five images, five image bursts per second. And we also have the bulk velocity, with, which, which we are measure, measuring with a um, flow meter in our rig. And what you can see first is that the measurements, um, they are quite sensitive to the interframe time that we are having between the image pairs. 
So basically, for most of the interframe times, you get a different result of the U component uh, ESO plot. And you have to see what's what's actually happening. For example, here is a very uh, short time. We are not able to capture the particle movement. And what we get here is some kind of a laminar profile, which we would expect. Or, for example, with a huge interframe time, we losing the, the image totally and not tracking the particles as well, as well because they're leaving the interrogation areas. And well, finally, we found for this Reynolds number uh, interframe time that corresponds to to the NS results that we got from from uh, work from Wu and Moin. So this is a quite sensitive system. So there are many parameters, but this seems to be like a predominant. And here you can see some results of our measurements. For example, here in figure 33, 31, you have the instantaneous uh, velocity um, planes of the U component. And also we can use uh, a reconstruction, which I will tell, talk later about, and apply a vortex identification criteria to obtain actually a 3D space, a 3D space of, the, of the vortex or of the vorticial swim strengths. And we can also, of this 3D uh, volume, we can also obtain slices. This is the horizontal slice of the swimming strengths, and this is uh, a parallel slice, so uh, a vertical slice of the swimming strength. So I want to go a bit more into detail uh, how we obtain those images, how we can actually visualize those clear structures. So uh, in lower dimensions, we can use local measurements, for example, pitot tubes, uh, CTA measurements, is hot wire basically, um, LDA measurements, which means we are only measuring measuring in one point and if we have a good time resolution, we can see if something is passing through through our observation area. So, for example, here in this part, I think this was a turbulent path. This was observed, so we have a time resolved measurement, and we can see if something is passing through our pipe. Right. Um, also, we can do plane measurements, like for example, conventional PAV. We can also use use smoke visualizations. For example, you can see this characteristic angle of the of the uh, hairpin vortex of 45 degrees. Uh, also other methods you can use, for example, the, the Schlieren method, which is based on the different diffraction of the, of the structures. And <clears throat> you can see in this image, figure 36, you can see um, how how we can actually visualize those um, hairpin vortex because we know that the angle is the upper angle which of the heads is more or less something like 17 degrees. So this is also a way how to actually um, obtain information about coherent structures in just lower dimensions. <clears throat> So um, in higher dimensions, of course, it gets a bit more complicated. Um, so one way to do it is, of course, do a direct measurement. For example, you can use tomographic PIB, which means that you have basically to turn into a spider. So it means you have many different cameras. And of course, the more cameras you have, uh, you get more dimensions and you get a better uh, idea of what is happening with the flow. But this is, of course, um, quite a different, diff difficult setup. So what we are doing with our experiment, we're using um, Taylor's hypothesis of frozen flow, which enables us to actually add a zero dimension to our flow. So you can see here a formal description of this hypothesis. It basically says that if we know what is the speed, the convection velocities of the structures in the flow, and also we know 
the the time interval between our yeah our, our sampling rate right this means we can create a, a time lag which can translate our temporal measurements and, and spatial measurements so it means we we uh, reconstruct our our dimension through which the flow is actually flowing and here in this case um, this is just a hot wire rate measurement and you can actually see it's it's just a, a, a local point measurement right but well there are many local point measurements here because it's a rake but only by knowing the sampling rate between the measurement we can reconstruct all this field here so that means we actually we actually convert our punctual measurement in a plane measurement as you can see here and of course you can use this to do the same thing also to uh, to reconstruct a 2D plane like ours into a 3D plane, a 3D volume, right? So this is a very important um, method we, we use. So I also want to talk about how we can actually visualize the vortex. You will see also already the, the DNS simulation over the air I showed you. So, um, a very, very common way is to use Larry methods, for example, the Q, the delta, the lambda CI, or the lambda 2 criteria. And all those methods, they are basically focused on our velocity gradient. So we know that uh, if we decompose this tensor, we obtain the symmetric part and the antisymmetric part, right? And actually, this symmetric tensor, he describes our deformation, our linear deformation, and our shear deformation. So this is not something we are so interested in, but we are more interested in this rotational part. So, for example, from our rotation tensor, we can get to vorticity criteria. Um, basically, all those criteria, they are based on the observation on our antisymmetric tensor of the U gradient. For example, the lambda CI criteria, the swelling strength criteria I'm using, it is based on the imaginary part of the eigenvalues of the U gradient tensor. So we obtain, we, we um, put a threshold for this, and then we print the ESO surfaces. And this makes us able to to observe actually the, the, the volumes of uh, high swelling strength. Also, I want to talk about very important things of machine learning and statistics. First, uh, uh, neural networks, they are, they are quite suitable to observe matrices. And what we obtain from measurement are matrices. So it can be directly our, our bits from, from our um, image matrix, or of course, also some, some scalar values, for example, the, the U component. And so the new networks, they are, they're quite good in, to observe those patterns and actually classify the structures. Of course, you can also use PUD analysis, which basically projects our observance in a different space and is able to, to cut off the, the frequencies that are not uh, of interest, and this gives us like a more um, detailed view of, of of what is actually happening in our flow in order to filter out the the the, the noise, right? And also very important, and this is also a method that we are using, is the conditional sampling. So conditional sampling, what does it mean? Um, basically, if we if we sample for for something in, in a disorder like like it is turbulence, we always get uh, out the result what we have sampled for. So it's not of a great use. For example, when fit for a direct hairpin, then I will always see a hairpin. So the object of this conditional sampling is that we look for something that is related to the thing that we want to see. So we correlate two different things. And if the correlation of the thing we sampled for 
shows another thing, that means there's something going on. So, for example, here you can see from David Dennis, um, he was using <coughs> spatial correlation of pipe flow. So he was, you can see this point here, and he used an algorithm that correlated um, velocity fluctuations similar to those on this point. Right? And for example, here in this plane, he only obtained a PIB snapshot. But if he says that, or if he filters all the all the PIB snapshots for for um, uh, velocity fluctuation that is similar, like this point, then by this condition of filter, filtering, you can see what is happening. For example, here, those are all the, the sample averaged vector fields, the in-plane vector fields with the same correlation. And then you can see that here they are forming small vortices that are defining the, the borders of the different correlations of the usual fluctuations. So it's vortex here, vortex here, vortex here, vortex here, always on this frontier between the two. So this is something that, that you couldn't see if you do any normal filtering. But if you put some conditions, like for example, in this case, the, the U fluctuation in one point, then you obtain really something that you can evaluate, for example, here, our in-plane structures. Um, for example, here, David Dennis did something similar as well. So he was conditioning for a hairpin vortex. But if your conditions are just for hairpin vortex, then we, you will always see the hairpin vortex. So what he actually did, he conditioned just for the swelling strength vector for one lakh of the hairpin vortex. And then he was able to see also these structures which have different swelling strength direction. So this actually shows us that there, there's something more than just the thing that we are conditioning for. And he was also able to see in the same condition assembling those velocity streaks, actually low speed streak that is sitting just below the hairpin vortex and those two high speed streaks on the side of it. So this is the way how you uh, apply condition assembling and obtain significant results. Okay, uh, eventually I want to recommend some literature I will also based this presentation on. Of course, this is like the main article from David Dennis itself. So it's on Korean structures and wall one turbulence. Very good review with a lot of information. Also the, the book from Bayoja Vulavi, which is about characterization of turbulent duct flows. So very good work. And also the article from Elsas and Wolikoni, where they talk about different vortex criteria and also propose their own, their own vortex criteria for visualization of vortex. I also want to thank for the financial support, especially for Peter Price, because they are financing our scaling project. And also from the CNBK, which has financed the first scholarships of mine. And of course, I also want to thank of all the laboratory personnel. This is a photo that was taken in 2018 in our Congress. And this is my data for contact. And yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>